this is me. Yeah. So I'm Jerry. Um, I basically do media and actually it's influencer things. Um, but because of that whole debate that I'll tell you about later, I changed it to community because I think it's the same. Um, but basically I work in Ericsson, um, Ericsson Networks. So the part that does all the network architecture stuff. I won't go into that, but um, I've been with Ericsson for almost two years now. Um, come September, I would be celebrating my two years. End of September, I came just in time for the darkness. I think everyone could identify with it since you're in London. <laughs> um, but yeah, originally I was from Singapore. Um, so I transited basically from full year, full life of summer to madness in one day. Um, four seasons in one day. Yes. Yeah. So that's a quick thing about me, things I like to talk about. So I would like to stay in touch after this. Um, talk to me, Andy, about 5G, secretly open run, um, social science. So that's my background. I studied psychology in school, but somehow did not end up touching it at all. Um, and I'm also an advocate of um, mental health awareness. Um, and my weaknesses, as you would know, are dogs, coffee, and books. Um, I love physical books. So a quick overview of my past lives. Um, I worked with Ericsson APAC. Um, so uh, Ericsson APAC, look at me. I'm always talking about Ericsson. You're fully indoctrinated, Jerry. I know. Look what they did. So Experian, the credit agency. I think you guys know of Experian UK. So um, yeah, I used to be their um, credit girl. <laughs> giving financial literacy talks and stuff like that. So that was me. Um, then I joined Airbnb to do internal communications. And then I joined Bridge Alliance um, to do everything, um, no, marketing, PR, everything. Um, Bridge Alliance is a telecoms um, alliance of operators. Um, so they basically come together, work together to make things happen in IoT, roaming, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm also a HubSpot ambassador, but I'm no longer that. <laughs> okay, so, so um, I wanted to start off with this because I think the crux of the debate, it's about the labels, you know, and also because it looks really cool to put that, that <laughs> influence word, how to pronounce it, but also because I'm probably gonna approach this a lot more as a more um, sociological perspective or a psychological perspective to because um, what I was really interested in when I was going through this whole process was um, basically what motivates people, how people will react. And I think that's what we always do, you know, when we do PR. So yes, um, this label is such a sensitive one. Um, that's why I want to highlight labeling theory, but yes, because that would de determine your reality. And I was sharing with Rich as well that I get put in a really awkward position as a PR person because some of my journalists and analysts really hate influencers, but at the same time, I'm also working with them. So to be seen working with both sides, it's going to be a really, really awkward position. And that's what I'm trying to manage right now. So that's why I'm looking and asking everybody what they think and stuff like that. And I think that's how Rich and I got talking. So I talk really fast because I'm Singaporean, but I try my best to slow down. Um, basically, these are the very different ways that you might hear of influencer marketing or influencer relations, whatsoever. I wouldn't go through everything, but yeah, this because it depends on which company you're in. It really is very different, very, 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 very different. So I listed out everything I could possibly think of. Um, I bet the list goes longer. Um, the thing that always comes back to, so it th depends whether you're talking about external influences or internal influences. Internal influences, then there's this whole other big, big thing that you unearth, which includes personal branding, employee advocacy, compliance, blah, blah, blah. So just wanted to lay it out now. And also at the same time, it is not anything new because it's basically sociology. So it's about lobbying. So for example, like how do you want to influence regulations, right? Um, Supplemental priming, you know, talking about recall, blah, 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 um, trying to get group think, you know, extremist behaviors and stuff like that. It's all about influencing. So, so that's where your social capital really matters. And I think we all know that in PR anyway. So this is the question that I always get. Why do we need influencer marketing? What is it for? Is it worth it? Um, this is my standard thing that I always tell people. Um, it's hard to explain to them. So um, 
I usually just keep it to two things. Third party voice, you need that because people trust people rather than just you repeating your own shit every time. Um, and of course, amplification. So the thing about an extended audience, you know, like LinkedIn, when you do marketing on LinkedIn, you get this like extended audience ability. Here, it's also the same. So like you can draw the comparison to design thinking where you also want to reach out to extreme user groups to kind of like, you never know because everything is connected. So I'll leave the data there. I'll share the slides with you all so you can dive into it. But it is worth it. That's the, in the nutshell, it is. <laughs> so the thing I wanted to share with everybody is that it is the same as what we've been doing long, long, long ago. So I've drawn from personal experience here. Um, so for example, when I was with Airbnb, we had a host for, uh, we, had, we had a festival for our hosts. And our hosts are actually our ambassadors. They're actually our influencers. It's just that we did not call it influencer marketing. We called it um, our host community engagement and stuff like that. So we did a lot of work. So if you think about it, like when people start questioning budgets for influencer marketing versus what Airbnb did for our host, which is our host community, we flew everybody to LA. We booked up the whole downtown LA. It's a huge budget. Um, and But that is what works for us. So it's not anything new. Influencer marketing is not new. Likewise for corporate events. So I used to work in Experian, which also used to host like an awards event for businesses. Um, it looks like we're just ranking businesses, but no, actually at the back of it, what we are doing is we're also selling credit reports and stuff like that. So business insights. So, but those businesses, once they get associated with us, you know, through that whole brand association, them being proud of it, them becoming ambassadors of us, then they always refer back to us when it comes to when they need business intelligence. And the last example would be really cool because it's Singapore and COVID. Um, we've been doing this for a long time ago. Last time when we had stars, um, we want people to wash their hands with soap um, because people don't apparently. Um, but so they they got like a celebrity that is very um everybody relates to because he speaks singlish like like crazy um but yeah we got they got him to do a rap and it was so catchy that everyone knew the message behind so i think our government did a good job there so they tried to do this for covid vaccines as well yeah not anything new event marketing blah 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 it's really not new it's just a different label that's my point um, so I'll jump into the debate. Ah, this is the soap opera. Um, this is the questions that you always get, like, why, what's the ROI? And I think actually I feel this a lot when I get asked this question about PR as well, you know, cause now we no longer measure ad space. So that is the big question I get and it's really hard to answer. I'm still trying to answer it. Um, the other question is also, why can't we just use paid ads? What's the difference? And I do have the answers to that later or before. Um, the other question I always get is, how do you choose who to work with? You know, and I do get some people who say that they're not professional because it depends on who you decide to work with, whether they're tech influencers. So tech influencers, they're of course more, um, I call them my geeks, my community of geeks. And they're really nice, but they're also really like, it is what it is. Um, or they're very um, friendly. So sometimes it might just be gibberish that they're interacting about. But, um, you know, from a corporate standpoint, when you're talking about B2B folks, um, to them, it's not professional enough and they don't want to be associated with that image. But I'm like, then how do you want to reach your audience? You know, like, so that is the big debates that happens here. So yeah they also don't believe in influencers a lot of people really don't believe in influencers i've checked in with ceos and stuff like that so um they basically believe they're paid to say good things but i'm like then what's the difference between an editorial versus a media interview that is earned like it's the same i i like to draw that parallel because it helps them understand a bit better but these are what's going on right now with this whole debate about influencer marketing. Sometimes it's really, so I think what I'll caution everyone here is about the label, depending on how sensitive your client is to um, all these things. Like, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's about using the word thought leaders instead or experts um, because 
in essence, it's the same thing. I I feel it's just about like what you decide to frame it as. So the only difference then will be paid or non-paid. And then paid is most of the time is because you're asking them to generate content. So you're just paying for the content and the work that goes into there basically. So it's actually not much of a difference from, for example, a paid slot for a key opinion piece. Mm -hmm. You know, so that is, yeah, Rich, you were going to jump. Yeah, I just, it's quite funny looking at Dean Bubbly's um, I love it. Sort of comment comment there because about five six years ago when in, when the term influencer marketing and influencer relations started to start to come about I was in a, at an event run by Brandwatch um, and at the Q&A Dean Bubbly stood up and started his well it wasn't so much a question as a statement with the phrase as an influencer I know really <laughs> Rich, you're going on a record with this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I... Well, I think it just goes to show how the, how it's developed, how it's evolved yeah. and how the, the terms, the, the word influencer has become quite loaded as various different functions within the marketing stack try Absolutely. to take control over something that may or may not be their wheelhouse um and how somebody who like dean who you know i think is influential yeah. um can sort of go sort of almost a full 180 from being you know describing himself as an influencer to then seeing what's been happening around influencer relations and then describing himself as anything but an influencer um so yeah it's just it just goes to goes to show how how these things evolving re really quickly and the, the labels that you apply are, i think when the when the facts change you have to change your mind yeah no i mean i feel i personally feel the same way ish um when i first joined ericsson and when i suddenly got this portfolio i was like mm, do i really believe in this you know and eventually after starting to work on it i I see the value in it, but I still honestly, but like, I still have a weird iffy. I still feel iffy about the label, um, yeah. because I don't know whether I want to be associated with the label really. Because I mean, um, for for everyone's background, I suspect this is my suspicion. I don't have data, but um, the bad taste that the word influencer has left in a lot of people's mouth is really because of the B two C sector as well. Um, you know, where it just got out of hand, you know, so you think about like Instagram, TikTok and stuff like that. Sometimes it really works. It's great. But um, at the same time, like, I mean, even in Singapore alone, you have like a lot of drama when it comes to influencer marketing in the B2C sector. So that has spilled over to the B2B area. And so people are a bit more, a lot actually, a lot more apprehensive about like going anywhere near that. So, yeah, they don't want to go near that. So, yeah, I totally feel that apprehension. <laughs> so, yeah, this is what we discussed. Um, maybe it's a question of labels. And at this point, I have a tip, which is um, it's all about finding that linchpin when you're thinking about influencer marketing. So I like to think about it like because sometimes it can, you can get really lost when um, there's not much information about B2B, B2B influencer marketing. Um, so how I choose to think about it is like thinking about mobs or like a family soap opera, you know. Um, so you'll be wondering why is Jerry talking about mobs? But think about like the, I think about the CSI board, you know, where they are trying to find and take down a mob. Okay, in this case, we're not taking down a mob, but like I'm likening it to like um, winning everybody over basically, right? That's what you want to do through influencer marketing. But mm -hmm. when you want to take down a mob, you look at how everybody's connected, who are the heads of his organization, blah, blah, blah. But your linchpin might not necessarily be the head of organization. It, it might just be the grandma sweeping the floor every day. And one small little thing that she does and that she doesn't do that day might change everything, you know, like that domino effect. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how I, I try and think about it because sometimes it's just one unsus unsuspecting individual that you need to influence instead of everybody else yeah um, yeah so likewise for in your family right 
instead of like trying to influence the rest of your family sometimes I just buddy up with my brother and then he's really good with my mom and then everything gets sorted out somehow so <laughs> influencer marketing at home yeah <laughs> that is a I thought that would be a helpful way to think about it really so the only difference right now that um so we're talking about actioning it is that now we have a lot of sexy technology and tools that will help us do this to help us take down the mob um and that includes all these kind of stuff so um you get listening tools you get to stock more efficiently basically um <laughs> stock more efficiently and you know like you can narrow down like let's say what beats people are on you know so the who who is listening to this? Who is having this conversation? Um, what is this? What are they talking about when they're having that conversation? Where are they talking about it? Are they talking on Twitter? Are they talking about Reddit? Are they talking where? Where does this happen? Or in the dark web? So if we can't find anything, then we know it's the dark web. Um, and how are they talking about it? So um, are they being more apprehensive? Are they being more objective? Stuff like that. So the tools have allowed us to do that. Um, it was. The madness is um, lies in the defining of the parameters of what to look for. So that usually is the madness. But once you have that, um, you can really do stuff with it. Because then you can be smarter about where you channel your resources and things like that. What exactly you want to measure, um, what alerts you want to come into your inbox daily. I have alerts every day for, um, for example, for open run, but I don't have that for 5G because there's so much crazy stuff coming up about 5G every day that my inbox will go nuts if I set an alert about 5G. So learn lesson. Yeah, after one week, I stopped it. Um, and then there's also setting up um, sessions to train um, your internal influences. This identification part can marry really well with um, when you are training, for example, media spokespeople. So I'll usually add on like half an hour, depending on, we need to get the person to say okay first and his boss, his or her boss to say, okay, that, okay, are you um, okay with being our social, um, being on social, you know, as a spokesperson? Um, and when they say, okay, then after that, um, we add on basically about 20 minutes to their media training too. Cause it's the same. You wouldn't say anything on social that you wouldn't say to the media cause the media are on social and screenshots do happen. Um, so yeah, you are forever on the record, right? So that is the training part that um, is really important as well um, because you need, sometimes it's a lot easier to deal with crisis comms with a person's handle instead of a brand handle. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of operations to think about. So um, especially for Ericsson, because like before that, when I was working for Bridge Alliance, I was one person. Um, I align with myself basically, but here in a larger company, I'll have to align with a lot of different people in order to make this happen. So social media team, what can I do? What can I do? What are the compliance guidelines? Um, analyst relations team, like, so who is going to answer when I see something on social? Like, for example, if I see something coming up from Gabriel Brown, like him having a question, um, do I take it as a influencer inquiry or do I take it as an analyst inquiry? So that is what we had to iron out. Um, media relations, likewise. So if a journalist inquiry, so for example, if Keith had a question um, about a press release, then I'll take that. But luckily, I'm also media relations, so I don't have to align with anybody. But um, those are the small little things that we have to do. Or if not, I have to funnel to another business area to answer that question. Then yeah, the rest similar, but also local teams, because sometimes um, Twitter is very US, Europe centric and Japan. Um, they might have other things that they need to localize, like whether it's it on Naver, Kakao, WeChat, so on. So yeah, that operations part is a huge nightmare, but it's necessary. <laughs> And then, of course, the nurturing and engaging. So there's the paid version and the non-paid version. Paid version, usually you're asking them to create content. Non-paid version are folks like, I would I would just call them like my journalists and analysts, actually. So I look at them as non-paid. Yeah, that makes sense. Because there's a bunch of people, people like Diane and co, um, who I see you chatting with happily, who have got sort of, is it Ericsson Influencer hashtag in there? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so how Ericsson started working with influencers was um, actually Tresta from BDGS. Um, I think you guys spoke with BDGS before, the digital services team. Um, they were the ones who just started it. Um, but we used, um, we worked with influencers mainly for MWC because yeah. MWC, there's just so much going on that your share of voice just gets diluted like crazy. So that's why they, they started using it. And um, yeah, it does work really well for events. Yeah, because then you get your message out there, you get seen. Yeah. That was also how I discovered Ericsson, by the way. Before that, I did not have friends when I went to MWC, so I went to Twitter um, to look for friends. Um, that's how I found you as well, Rich. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, apart from going to bars, um, I basically look at the MWC hashtag, saw a lot of Ericsson ambassadors tweeting. I thought they were there, but they weren't. They were remote. Um, so I was really sad, but um, that's really, that was the turning point where I managed to make more friends in the telecoms mm. industry. Cause especially when you're a new PR type starting off in a new industry, you're like, where do I even start? How do I make friends? How I don't even have a relationship to start with, you know? So that was my ground zero, um, apart from drinking in the bar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So these are some things to look out for. Um, just, um, how do you say, like I realized it um, slowly and some things I'm still worrying about, like for example, echo chambers. But the problem then is that like, for example, on LinkedIn, all I see are people liking each other's stuff on LinkedIn. It's like within your little click and that doesn't really do anything. So I just cautioning um, about echo chambers. Mm. Um, that is something but probably it's a happy problem, right? That's the next phase of the whole advocacy journey. Then of course, um, crisis comes and compliance because the more visibility you get or your executives get. So this really opens a can of worms, but um, it's necessary. So it's really important to work with crisis comes and compliance, especially during the 5G is dangerous for everybody um, saga. So yeah. Um, there's also a lot of internal education and babysitting and a lot of insurance, uh, reassurance actually, when you work one-on-one -on -one with executives to convince them to be more consistent and social, because a lot of time it's just all in their minds. They're just really worried. They'll say something wrong. So yeah. it's pretty much similar to guiding them in media training, but it's a lot more babysitting and handholding. Um, yeah. Then the sandwich problem I shared with you about. And then there's this whole other part about smarting the algorithm. So because we work a lot on platforms like Twitter and LinkedIn, um, there are ways to smart the algorithm. For example, the longer the person views your post on LinkedIn, um, the longer the time spent, the more LinkedIn will push out your post. But at the same time, I'm all for short and sweet. So it's about weighing how, you know, that balance between how you want to smart the algorithm to, to push your posts and your messages out there versus what, what is your brand value, basically? Yep. And the rest are pretty much explanatory. Um, a lot of big numbers are used in influencer reporting. And I would like to caution about that because <laughs> <meh>. <laughs> I look at the qualitative stuff. For example, if like an operator, someone like a prominent officer, an operator looks, likes my executive's post, I'm like, that's a win. Mm -hmm. You know, or I get an analyst briefing from that. That's a win rather than the big numbers. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. It's too easy, isn't it, with influence marketing to look at sort of the numbers get so huge. impressions and things like that. Cause you yeah. know. So reporting is very, very, very important as of now. No, cool. Got it. Thank you. So this is the last one, which is basically where to start if you want to start. Um, so basically ask yourself what's the desired outcome. Um, because that will depend, determine how you're going to approach it because it's a big monster because it's a combination of a lot of different parts of marketing, really. And it really depends on the company setup. Um, and then who's important to you? So who do you want to focus on first? So, um, and then what's practical of your existing resources? Because very few companies will actually even have resources for a social media person. Yeah. So this is going to be even worse. So whether it's going to sit within social media or PR or whatsoever, and then time is of essence. So yeah. Yeah, grill me. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I think I took quite a while.
No, that, that, that's, that's super, that's 20, but... super interesting. Um, thank you. I have like a ton of questions, um, but, but I'd like to turn it over to other people to talk first um, because, you know, I will dominate oxygen if that's the thing. Duncan Chapel. Yeah, I, 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 I love this presentation. And so I, I, I had two specific questions. So one is like, it's like, like someone like Evan Christel, who um, certainly I believe that I've got clients who are paying him to m mention them more often. <clears throat> I, 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 I think he typifies a, a problem in kind of explaining influencer work, which is this balance between influencers yeah. who are like super open for business and, and okay, you know, they're, they're not going to say that they love peanut butter if peanut butter kills them, but there are people who are open for business. And on the, on the other hand, there are real relationships that you're nurturing and, uh, and where, where you're building engagement and building up a, a conversation. H how do you explain that internally? And then my second question is, what are your favorite tools uh, when it comes to managing this? Mm. So first one, um, I'm also having that problem, really, because Evan is a monster. He's a machine. Um, and we say it with, with, it's a compliment. He is a machine. But also, it depends what you want. Then if you want share a voice, you want reach, Evan will get you that reach. It's still a lot of internal education to do with this. Um, I always tell them, I want your brains. I don't want your reach. But yeah, um, so I hope that answers the first part. Um, the second part is um, I love using Twitter alone. So um, because mainly my audience is on Twitter, especially for telecoms. So um, I just use Twitter lists. Um, I started building my list since I joined telecoms. So 2000. And Oh, damn it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> three years ago, three, four years ago. And that's where um, I start building those lists. Um, and then I use TweetDeck to kind of like dig. Um, I also spoke of um, some reports and insights and digging that we did. Um, I So far, we've been working with Analytica on that. Um, yep. Yeah, but their platform is still in its infancy. I have my whole entire wish list that I sent to them about what I want in terms of enhancements. Um, <laughs> but it's pretty good from there. I have not tried Hootsuite, um, but um, I heard the echo, the Hootsuite echo is really good for uh, employee advocacy. Yeah. Apart from that, then I use tag mode for engaging the paid celebrity kind of influencers. They save my life because I cannot manage that. Um, <laughs> so I make use of agencies when I can. Yeah. 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 Tech mode was that. Yeah, I can I can I can send you a link. Cool. Thank you very much indeed. No, it's interesting because you sort of see all of these all of these tools that are available, right? You know, yeah. and I guess you've got your sort of Cadillac version, which is your sort of tracker um, type stuff. But you know, when they were relatively early um, in the market, I I went and did some tests on them, and you know. You find mm -hmm. if you're looking at shampoos and dog food and things like that, but you know, you start looking into right. I need someone who's an expert on, I don't know, four G infrastructure. Right? It's just there's nothing there. The keywords are the tough part. So Meltwater also has actually. I, I'm guessing you have Meltwater, but Meltwater has a part that allows you to look for influencers or journalists who write about, for example, cloud infrastructure, or um, yeah, about finance stuff um the other one um in analytica that you can do is they can search on so i can search on a profile on myself for example if i am on their platform and then i get to see my network map which is my favorite thing ever um it's basically the csi board of my life yeah on twitter um and that was that see... was a few slides ago wasn't it uh no i didn't have that here because i'm not allowed to show it outside, but um, yeah, that is my favorite thing ever. It shows basically, Rich, how many times you and I talk to each other, whether it's a <laughs> one-way conversation or a two-way conversation and what those conversations are, but they are unable to measure at present um, like sentiments and stuff like that. Right. Um, but I thought that was interesting because like then, even if you see a lot of influencer activity but on some brand channels, um, Sometimes when you look into it, you see that it's a one-way conversation. Basically, them reaching out to people, no one's reaching out to them. Yeah. 
And I think that is important to take mm. into account as well. Mm. Totally, totally agree. Katie, you have your hand up. I do. Um, that was yeah. great, Jerry. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Question for you. So you've talked about, everybody asked the question, what's the ROI? You've talked about the fact that you think the qualitative stuff has to be considered, you know, again, say the big numbers. Can you give some examples and talk about how you um, have measured and, and the types of reports mm. that you might put together? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a lot to do with how we defined it at the start. Um, the problem that I faced at first was that I inherited this. So I wasn't part of the objective setting that made reporting very, very, very tricky um, mm -hmm. because then it was just the big numbers, which was not what people were convinced by. But the numbers do matter because it does give uh, impression of like how that reach has imploded. Um, there are different things. So we are, even with tech mode, I work with tech mode for influencer marketing for paid influencers. And we have been, um, how do you say, refining our KPIs. Um, so previously it was potential impressions, right? So it's mm -hmm. the most iffy number ever. But now there's like uh, potential actual impressions, which um, uses like a weighted average or something like that. Um, there's a percentage that you take off based on some studies that have been done. So the number is a lot smaller. It's probably a lot more accurate, but still not accurate. So things like that. Um, we also measure share of voice. So um, in, for example, Meltwater, you can measure like social share of voice, right? For this mm -hmm. editorial share of voice. And we basically measure how that changes. There's no causation, um, but we suspect there will be some form of correlation because then you can go in, scroll down, um, quickly browse through, see if it's a lot of mentions of your brand in that era, in that topic. So as share of voice, um, potential actual impressions, clicks. Sometimes we do clicks, but we realize that click throughs are not something for um, paid external influencers. Um, people barely click. They just read mm -hmm. what's in the feed. Mm -hmm. um, but we still measure it anyhow, because sometimes we just want people to, for example, like join this webinar. Yeah. So that one we measure or download this report. Um, yeah. So then you lose. Physically use, call to yeah. action. Yeah. Exactly. So we use a combination of UTMs as well as Bitly because mm -hmm. um, Google Analytics is funny sometimes. So it's nice to have two sources to compare and <laughs> moderate expectations. But yeah, these are some um, stuff that um, like more tangible metrics. Then mm -hmm. I would try my best to have like, uh, what do you call that? Um, screenshots. So mm. basically, who has interacted with this? Are there any operators? Are there any um, C-suite level people who are from reputable companies? Um, are there, um, for example, as well, since we are in the PR space, there are some some instances where it has resulted in coverage. You know, just, just showing that, that whole process, mm -hmm. helping people or your internal stakeholders understand that this had a part to play. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I guess that's where the objectives help as well, because if the if the objectives go beyond, say, increasing network traffic and you're looking for engagement among whether it's C-suite people, operators, then it enables, enables you to go, yeah. here's how we tick that box. And then also, just as you're responding to other questions, do you mind just, can you go back onto that slide that you were on before this? Just because I wanted to, to read what was on there. I, I've not quite been back. I have too many screens. Oh. Is it this um, one? No, it was the, um, it, that's it. Yeah, that's okay. the one. So if you wouldn't mind leaving that up, that'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Andrea, you have a question. Hello. Oh. Hello. 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 Thank you for the info. I was wondering if you have uh, encountered the reverse of the situation that you've been speaking about where you've got a C-suite um, member of, of your, your client um, company and they're, they're very keen to be positioned as an influencer or a thought leader but for whatever reason they're not quite right for that as a spokesperson so have you ever had that instance where you've successfully sort of steered them away and maybe suggested somebody else within the company to be a spokesperson yes 
Absolutely. There are some very enthusiastic individuals, especially I think you experience that as well in the media space where they want to speak to the media, but they're just not ripe yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had that in my experience in Bridge Alliance, basically. Um, my CEO, I was tiring her out too much. And she's like, I really need my other people to be doing this, but they're not ripe yet. Um, mm. So it's really having to pull her back um, and train the rest and also need, like, um, usually putting them on a stage helps. So, like, um, starting with, like, a small seminar, webinar that helped a lot so getting them more seasoned I think um, especially with the media first um, or just public speaking that helps a lot before they actually engage on social because that is kind of scary because it's more live you know <laughs> yeah so yeah that, that really helped yeah getting them a bit more like Q&A how to handle that blah 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 yeah brilliant thank you thank, thank you, you. Uh, Amelia. Hello. Um, so just a quick one. Um, so in terms of like B2B influencer marketing, do you feel Instagram works as a platform that is beneficial for a B2B campaign? As obviously the content like Reels, IGTV, there's a lot of visual content. So do you feel that kind of works within B2B? I haven't actually had that experience that Instagram worked for B2B, at least not in my capacity. Um, mm -hmm. Nor do I, I like I'm on Instagram a lot, but all I look at are plants, dogs and cats. Um, <laughs> and I don't really I curate my how do you say I curate whatever they're going to show me. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't even see any B2B stuff there, actually. Um, the only ones that I see are probably like, um, how do you say, for example, when I was a HubSpot ambassador, I get HubSpot ads there and I actually look at it um, because I mean, it's targeting marketers. And of course, I'm. I'm always keen to know what events going on and stuff like that. But apart from that, I am iffy about Instagram, honestly, and TikTok and all the likes. <laughs> what um what platforms would you say kind of works the best if you're wanting influencer marketing within a B two B campaign? It really depends on your sector, I would say. If you're targeting like geeks like gamers I would say go into reddit um, I don't I don't think people really do reddit now but um, that's something I'm trying to explore on the site for fun um, so far Twitter has really taken off um, LinkedIn is getting weird now um, I don't know how to explain it but <laughs> LinkedIn is getting weird now people are taking taking it differently um, mm -hmm. It's getting a bit more cringe. So if you're talking about authenticity, like um, I would, my personal take is that um, LinkedIn is good to interact with internal um, audience. They get the pride from there. That's so yeah. our clients and partners who just don't really get the engagement there, but it happens. Mm -hmm. They see it, they acknowledge it. People usually get DMs instead. Yeah. yeah, I feel like with LinkedIn, it's just heavily now becoming more visual, especially mm. video content and imagery and stuff. So I feel like from what I've seen content wise, I feel like if unless you're putting something that's quite visual and capturing, it doesn't tend to land very well on LinkedIn. Yeah, they actually prioritize videos now, native videos. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's why everyone is uploading that. I just I don't know. I don't know how to feel about emojis. Um, I'm not sure. It depends on your brand, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Cool. And then I just had sort of two two final um, things. Number one is sort of how many ambassadors are you running, and what's the sort of split between paid and earned? Haha. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have the um, whenever I have that, um, I get about maybe five ambassadors. Mm -hmm. um, to cover different grounds. So whether is it the enterprise folks or the, you know, the CSPs or the academia folks, there are really a lot of different buckets. That makes sense. I think, you know, it's what, interesting what you say around academics, because it's sort of rel they're relatively underutilized in, uh, yeah. in, in telecoms. Yeah. Uh, we've been, <laughs> I don't know if, Ad, if uh, Alan's um, on the call and, and Nabila, but, um, you know, we, 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 we run the uh, judging for the uh, GSMA Glomo Awards and um, we've been trying to sort of 
bulk up on uh, on academics over the last few years because it's all getting very analyst heavy. Now, journalists don't have any time to do these things anymore. Let me match make you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, but but they've actually been quite hard to engage, um, mm. you know, because they're not an absolute expert in the particular category we're asking them mm. to. They're, oh, I'm not really sure. You know, it's like, you know way more than most other people. Um, so we've had to do quite a lot of uh, convincing to start to get those those guys involved. But it's an interesting, an interesting area. And then I guess my final question was, you know, you've done your identification, be it either through Analytica or your Twitter lists or what, you know, whatever lists are out there about sort of important people in or influential people in telecoms. How on, on a how do you approach them? Um, like how do you sort of if you if you're looking how do I to, romance people <laughs> yeah so like is it, is it a case of you know you simply rock up and go hey um we'd love to involve you in our ambassador scheme and um we'd like you to write us a blog post on this or we'd love your thoughts on blah for this panel we're doing and we'd love you to join like what what sort of approach do you do you tend to take e- I start following them first <laughs> like uh like a subtle like ah oh, I notice you and then <laughs> start engaging a bit more and then that's the long game like which is what all of you do in PR anyway mm. but for um straight up like if I have a budget and I want to use that person just just ask the person mm. yeah just be thick skin um <laughs> and just lay it as it is because um I rather yeah I'm very straightforward um might be a personal thing. But at the same time, also, like, if it's something that is organic, so, like, um, yeah, given that I already know the person, or even if I don't know the person, then start following them, um, kick off something a bit, and then drop the bomb. Um, yeah, <laughs> drop the bomb. I want to do this. Are you interested? I think it'll be cool for you. But, yeah, um, that's how I typically approach them, I guess. If you want That's... academics, um, I I would love to help you match make as well. Cool, yeah. sounds good. But the problem is that people always think about like, what does she have? Like, what's the intention? You know, like I what's have a angle? secret agenda. Yeah. I actually don't. So after a while, they realize it. But <laughs> <laughs> it can be quite if I have an agenda, I'll tell you right away. You know. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, that's brilliant, Jerry. Thank you so much. That has been that thank has been you. super interesting. You know, as I as I said to the team, you're kind of at the cutting edge of this. There isn't really anybody else doing um, doing sort of B two B influence marketing at scale. Certainly not in telecoms. Um, and other than a bunch of people who are paying Evan Kerstall to retweet the odd thing here and there, they don't really, they, there isn't sort of like a huge rush into it like we anticipated. But it's a start, it's the sort of thing that starts to come up more and more often. Yes. Um, and it's interesting to sort of see how this uh, how this evolves. Um, and different sectors are, are at different stages. Um, I think in fintech, for example. Now, there's a lot of non-traditional influencers out there who wouldn't mm. necessarily fit into an analyst or a journalist bucket, um, but who are having sort of like quite a big say um, on, on a number of different issues. Um, and yeah, it sort of it, it differs across the various sectors that we look at. But that has been super, super helpful. Um, if I don't think anyone's got any any more questions, I think Katie's hand up is still is, is still up from earlier. Um, yeah, that's uh, accidental. <laughs> but we will we will look forward to seeing you um on on twitter um and yeah. uh, and following your rise and rise and yeah i'll be in touch on academics yeah let's let's stay in touch um this conversation doesn't have to end here we can i love geeking out about stuff so yeah we can geek out together study together figure out what the hell open run is together yeah <laughs> absolutely thank you so much super thank you so much for your time Jerry. Right. really appreciate it Bye. Thanks, you. Thanks everyone for joining. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.